Well, good evening, everyone. It is good to be back with you tonight. I hope that you'll uh, open up your Bibles and read along as we study this portion of the Scriptures in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> And we'll actually begin at verse 1. We'll just read through, starting at verse 1 through verse 11. <clears throat> Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who uh, called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are, if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and is forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so, one of the first things that I want to point out about this lesson is, is this question uh, that we should be asking ourselves. Is, is my call and election sure? Is your call and election sure? Do we build on our faith? This is an ongoing process that we see that's going on here. And as we are going to study tonight, I hope that all of us can take away from this that this isn't something that's a one and done deal, that we go through these, this list of virtues, that we add these things, and that once we've added all these things to our faith, then that's it, done. And then we can put away our Bible and we can... Uh, have had all knowledge added to us, and we think, okay, well, that's it. I'm done. I've, I've, I've gotten all these things. Check them off the list. I don't have to do anymore. These are things that are ongoing. These are ongoing uh, conditions. These are ongoing things that we need to be building up. We're not going to ever be completely perfect in any one of these things, but these are things that we should all be striving for in our everyday life to be uh, uh, to make sure that our call is, is sure, that our election is sure. Because one of the questions that's often asked to Christians is, you know, are you going to heaven? Do you have a surety that you're going to heaven? And, and a lot of times we back off from that question. We back off from answering that. And we, we think, well, I don't want to presume yes. I don't want to say yes for sure. I have a, a, a spot in heaven because, you know, I've done all these things. You know, we shy away from that. But if we're following these things, if we're doing these things, we should have that confidence. We should have that understanding that, yes, that as long as I am doing my absolute best, I'm giving all diligence to these things, then, yes, I can say that there is a home for me in heaven. Because it's sad to, to hear that answer from people that they, uh, and to, to see people kind <clears> of <throat> skirt around that question. Because that's what our faith is based on, is that we have a home in heaven waiting for us and that we can proudly say that Jesus Christ died for me and has provided me a home and I, I'm on my way there. I'm on my way there. So the first thing that I want to point out too is that this is from Peter. Uh, this is someone who, as we you know, see all of the, uh, the things that he said, you know, whenever he decides to start saying something or start doing something, he's, he's the guy that kind of jumps in, you know, without thinking about something. And, and when he opens his mouth, you know, he doesn't just put one foot in his mouth, but he puts both of them in his mouth. And so it's someone that I can relate to a lot because that's, that's how I do things a lot of times too. 
And so it's very encouraging for me to see the growth in Peter to this point, that these are the things that he's also trying and striving for. And so these are the things that I should also strive to add to my faith as well. And so as we go through this <clears throat> list of things today, tonight, um, I hope that we can take something from it and apply it to our everyday life and that we can, it, it resonates with us. <clears throat> so for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue. <clears throat> so side note real quick. Uh, the, there is a, a word there to, uh, for supplement um, or provide that is being used in this passage. Add is in, in, this, pa uh, in this translation, add to your faith. Um, when it's saying that word there, add or unto, supplement, provide, those words that are used in all these different translations in verse, um, verse 5 and verse 11, where it also says supplied in verse 11, you'll underline those words. Those are the exact same word that's used in both of those instances. And what that word means, as it's being used there, is to furnish besides, that is, fully supply aid or contribute to add or minister, which means, you know, the, the nourishment, adding nourishment unto these things. And what I've seen this word used for as well, not in just the, the Bible, but um, in other sources that I was able to find, it, it says that this is something that, um, you know, that they would add to like a, a play or something. So if they needed to have props, they needed to have something there, um, that somebody would provide those things, someone would administer those things, someone would give all of those things that were necessary. And so this is being used for both us, that we are to add these things, that we're to grow in these things, and that we're to provide these things. And so this is our part. And that once we have done our part here, God has already done his part too, but in, in verse 11 there, it says that these, an entrance will be supplied. So there's a, a, a give and take here when it comes to these words. So just underline those and, and just realize that those are the same word and are being used for those things. But add to your faith virtue. So what is virtue? Well, simply, it's courage and determination to do what's right. And uh, when we look at this word, when we look at this, this passage here, <clears throat> uh, Philippians, in Philippians, hopefully it helps us to to have more of an understanding for these things. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do and the God of peace will be with you. We need to have courage and determination to do what's right in all instances, and this puts to mind David whenever he's fighting Goliath, and he gets there, and he's on the battlefield, and he, he realizes that <clears throat> this is a, mo a moment in his life where he needs to have this kind of virtue, where he needs to have this kind of courage and determination to take on this individual that nobody else has stepped up to the plate to take on yet. Nobody else has had this courage uh, to, to go through and determine this man is blaspheming God. This man is, is standing against the armies of God and, and he needs to be stopped. You know, do we have this virtue in our life? Do we, do we add to our faith this virtue? Do we add to our faith this courage and determination to do what's right in all instances? This is one of the things that we need to have. And these are like stepping stones. These are like, uh, you know, the, the, the set of stairs that are leading up to a, a certain place, some place that we would like to go. You know, several times there are locations that we go to on uh, whenever we go on vacation. Uh, there's steps that we have to take. Whenever we went, you know, overseas, that Kayla's planning to go and and go overseas again. Uh, whenever we wanted to go to the Blarney Stone, and you know, we wanted to kiss the Blarney Stone. That was that was a lot of fun. But there's a lot of stairs that we had to climb in order to get there. And, and you have to, you can't just skip those stairs. 
especially in those turrets, especially in those old castles where the steps are so small. If you try to, to jump and, and uh, go up those stairs, you, no, not happening. And if you start falling down those stairs, you're not stopping until you get to the end. You know, it is not fun at all. And so we imagine these things. That this isn't something that you can just step over. You can't just skip these steps. Otherwise, we'll stumble, we'll fall, and we'll get back to square one. The next thing on the list is knowledge, knowing the will of God. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So what do we, how do we know what the will of the Lord is? Well, we have to dive into the scriptures. We have to, to read the, the, the scriptures every single day to accumulate that knowledge, to grow in that knowledge. One of the things that this puts me in mind of, uh, for, for each of these things, I have uh, an example of somebody um, that, I, that I was thinking about. And the person I thought about for this was Noah. You know, he had the, the instructions that was given to him, right? He had the knowledge of what he needed to do but how did he do it? Did God give him the knowledge of, of how to, to build this ark, how to build this, this boat? That he, he, he gave him the instructions on how to do it, but he had to go through and then do it as well. It wasn't just about knowing what that will is, but also implementing it. It wouldn't have been enough for Noah to just have understood, okay, well, that's the plan. That's how you want me to do it. Okay, well, are you going to do it? <laughs> because if you don't actually do it, then that knowledge is, is useless. If you don't actually go through and utilize it, that knowledge is worthless. And so we see as an example in someone like Noah how that knowledge was provided by God, the instruction is given to us by him, and that he implemented it. Do we implement the knowledge that we receive from God in our everyday life? It's right here. It's, it's easy to digest in a lot of senses. It's easy to, to pick up and, and to read and to be able to understand it. God didn't make his will for us unknown. He, he didn't make it to where it is this uh, far-fetched thing that we have to strive to reason for as what Peter's actually trying to combat in those times. There was people there that were trying to say, well, we're part of a secret club. We're part of this you know, extra club over here that you guys need to come to and, and will give you a full understanding. No, God had already revealed his will. And this is enough. This is what he's given to us. Let's dive into the scriptures and learn and do. The next thing on the list there is temperance. It's self-control. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 23. It says, now this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be a partaker of it with you. And do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may be uh, able to obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body back and bring it into submission, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Do we strive? Do we have this kind of, of self-control? Do we have this level of temperance in our Christian lives? You know, a lot of times we'll, we'll, get, on, uh, we'll get all gung-ho on, on doing this. We'll get on a diet. We'll get on a, uh, some sort of workout uh, routine. We'll, we'll strive for that. And there are some people that do that and, and that they are strict and they stick to it. Their stick to itiveness is great and they're able to do that day in, day out. And <clears throat> I applaud people that have that level of temperance, of self control for that. You know, there for a while, I know Madison used to run cross country and that kind of inspired us to, to do a little bit of that running as well. And the, the furthest I was able to run was eight miles. And then it some, seemed like after that, it's like, okay, well. <clears throat> That's enough. <laughs> Let's put the running shoes away. And, uh, you know, that, that's just one of those things where we, we, we go for it. And we get to a certain point and we think, okay, well, it's time to retire. 
It's time to put those things away. But then what happens? Now I probably couldn't even run half a mile without losing my breath and healing over. You know, that's, it's just one of those things where, like, if you do not use it, if you do not keep applying it, you lose it. That's, that's why these are stepping stones. That's why these are stairs. That we, as we continue to add to these things, we, we move on to the next level. But that doesn't mean that that step doesn't disappear anymore. It's still there. We still need to continue to grow from that. The next thing on the list there is patience. Well, and I didn't, I didn't give the example. Let's jump back to, to temperance for a second. But, uh, that self-control, that someone utilized self-control was Nehemiah and how they were, being, they were under attack. And, and a lot of times whenever we're under attack, the immediate reaction is to what? Go on the offensive, attack back. But what he did was not fighting back. What he said to do was, don't fight back, but we'll set guards in place. And so that way we'll be protected, but we can continue on about what we need to do. We need to rebuild these walls. We need to rebuild the city. Patience, moving on. Patience is uh, standing up under life's difficulties. <clears throat> Let's turn to James. James chapter 1. And verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. We need to know that the testing of our faith is going to produce this patience. And let's also jump over, jump down to verses, uh, or chapter 5. Verse 3. Starting in verse 7. It says, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it, is rece until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And then drop down to uh, verse 11. It says, indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the uh, perseverance of Job, and seen uh, the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So when we see this, you know, as this verse points out, it puts us in the mind of Job. And we talked about him. Uh, Brother Doug Roush uh, spoke about this as well uh, in great detail. But when we think about someone who's patient, Job should, should definitely be the, the top of the list. He should be the first one we think about when it comes to patience for all the things that he had to endure. You know, there's a lot of times where, you know, we get you know, been out of shape, or we get, we get, you know, set off just because something goes wrong, something inconveniences us, something just little. This man here lost everything that he had in a matter of moments, in a matter of th a few people, a few messengers' breaths. They, they came in running to deliver the message to him that all of his livestock was gone, that his children were dead, that everything was taken from him. The only thing that he had left in that, fir that first round was his health and his, and his wife. That was it. And then later, even his, his health had been taken from him. But he endured through all of that. He endured through the, 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 the friends that he had that came to visit him, that came to, to, to lament with him, to, that came to encourage him. He endured through all of that because... They kind of turned on him, didn't they? They said, you, you wouldn't have all these things happen to you if sin weren't somewhere in your life. But he had patience to stand up under all of life's difficulties that was handed to him. The next thing is godliness. Being like the Heavenly Father. Let's turn back to 2 Peter. And we'll turn to chapter 3 and verse 11. It says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? We need to be godly. And the person that I thought of when it comes to godliness is a person that we really don't know too much about is Enoch. And how he walked with God and, and he was not because he was taken away. You know, Enoch had spent his life 
pursuing God, following Him, walking with Him. And He was taken. They were akin to each other. They were, he, he, he followed after God. He wanted to be, have the same attributes, the same characteristics of the Heavenly Father. Do we try to add those things to our life? Do we to try to have the same characteristics that God shows to us and then demonstrate those things to other individuals as well in our life? Do we do, we do those things? The next thing on the list is brotherly kindness. And this is something, you know, we, we talked about it this morning. This is something that we definitely show here. And I, I want to appreciate again all the generosity from everyone who has, you know, uh, scraped up whatever you could, has given us some donations to take with us, uh, not only in the form of money, but also things to take there as well. We thank you guys so much for that. But more than that, the brotherly kindness that's shown here, at least towards us, has been great. You know, even this morning, you know, there was a couple more offers uh, for us. It's like, you know, uh, I was asked if Kayla and I ever get the chance to really go out on a date. And they're like, if ever, if ever you need someone to come over and babysit for you guys, <laughs> just so you can get away for a couple of hours, let us know. But not only that, but whenever we are first coming here, you know, I just I think back to the brotherly, brotherly kindness that was shown to us, that so many people opened their homes up to us, and that we got to visit with one another, and, and uh, just, just all the love that has been shown to us in so many ways. Let's keep that going. Let's make that contagious. Let's inspire others to have that same kind of brotherly love. Love the brethren. We should want to spend more time with one another. Let's get together more often. Let's share in that. I think of uh, an, the, the individual that I thought of for, for brotherly kindness was Jonathan to David. And how Jonathan loved David so much. It was, he was like a brother to him. And his father didn't really care too much for, uh, for David at all. And was seeking to kill him. And Jonathan, you know, figured out this way to try and, and make sure that David knew whether or not it was going to be safe for him to, to escape or not. He, he had David's back, right? He always had his back. That was a brother to him. They loved each other. They looked out for each other. And that's what we do here, too. Let's keep that going. And finally, <clears throat> not yet. <laughs> finally, let's look at charity. Charity, and we've added all these other things. Finally, we come to the last one, and that's love. And we can read uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. Now abide, faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. We need to have love and we need to have the agape love. We need to make sure that the, oh, that went blank, didn't it? Okay. Um, if we don't have the agape love that we are to have, then, you know, then what is that? You know, we can look at all of these things and, and just take the time to read all of 1 Corinthians 13 to see what love truly is. It's not just something that's, you know, where we say it, and it's just some sort of sounding brass. It's not some sort of uh, tingling cymbal, uh, clanging cymbal. It's not something that we just, you know, you know, shout at the rooftop and say, okay, I love you, okay, well, and then not, and do nothing. And not do anything, not have anything to back it up. There's a long list of things that goes into what love truly is. And Jesus demonstrates all of it. Jesus demonstrates every last bit of what love truly is because he laid down his life for us. While we were sinners, while we were in rebellion against him, he laid down his life for us that we could have eternal life. Let's not forget that. Let's have that same kind of love to those that are in this building, to those that are out of this building, that we would do whatever it takes for these individuals, that we would love everyone so much that we would strive to tell them of the saving power of the gospel, of, of Jesus' love for them. 
regardless of how people may look at us, regardless of how they may treat us. Jesus loved each and every one of us so much that he died for them. And it would be a shame, it would not be love on our part if we did not tell as many people as we possibly can of that sacrifice. And so as we add all of these things to our faith, we read on, we read further, that if we do not possess these qualities, that we're not going to be able to see afar off. Let's turn back to our, our passage there. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse, <clears throat> verse 9, it says, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So when we see this word here, what, what's, um, what's interesting about the, the verbiage there for short-sighted even to blindness, it, it's, it's like a, a bright light has been shown and, and it's like a blinking is what they mean by this. So when they talk about this, this short-sightedness, this blindness, um, they're talking about the blinking that happens if you step out of a dark room and, out, and stand outside when it's high noon and it's just so blindingly bright, um, you just start to kind of like squint and blink. You can't hardly see anything that's going on around you. The worst time that I've ever had about this was um, when I worked at the Ripley Walmart um, because of it was winter and the snow, whenever it snows so much, the roof, uh, you have to go up, up the, the ladder. You have to see how much snow is up there because you have to know how much weight is up there. And you determine that by taking a test tube up there and you plop it down in there and you see how high it is and you do some calculation and you figure out how much weight is on the roof. So that way you know whether or not someone needs to come in and blow it off there before it collapses inside, which would be, had been awful. But going up there, that was the most blinding I've ever been, uh, ever experienced in my life is you, you going up this little dark tunnel and then whenever you open that latch up and you have some light shining in, but then you go and step out and all this snow is reflecting that back in your life and you're, you're just blinking, you're blinded, you can't see. I couldn't hardly see what was going around me. I, I, there was no chance that I was going to be able to navigate out there because there's all kinds of pipes and tubes up there that were going from AC unit and drain pipes here and vents here and there. If I tried to walk anywhere, I'd have stumbled and fell and it would not have been a fun time. But we would be the same if we don't have these qualities. We're not going to be able to see past the, the, the discouragements that we have in this life. We're not going to be able to fix our eyes on heaven if we don't have these qualities in our life. We will be blind. And we will have forgotten that we have been cleansed of our past sins if we don't have these things in our life. But if we do possess these qualities, then they're going to keep us from being barren. They're going to keep us from being ineffective. Verse 8, it says that if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to keep us from being unfruitful. They're going to keep us from being unproductive. If we add all these things to our life, we're going to go out into the world. We're going to have all of these characteristics, these, these virtues and people are going to be drawn to God because of those things, because of our example to those that are around us. And we're going to be able to encourage people around us because of those things that we have implemented in our lives. We're not going to stumble. We're not going to fall. Because we won't be blind. We'll be able to see. We'll be able to rely on God. We'll be able to, uh, to rely on Jesus to navigate us through this life. We will receive. We will receive, absolutely receive a rich and warm welcome into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's what we're striving for. That's what we want. That's what we hope for. And that's what we will receive if we add these things to our lives. Have we added these things? Is this something we're working towards? Is this something that we've added to our, to our life? Are we still working on it or have we given up? It's something that we need to put back into our everyday life of trying to work on these qualities.
If you haven't, if you've put these things away, you've, you've put them out of your mind, you've forgotten about them, let's use this as a reminder for us that we need to implement these in our life, that we need to grow in all of these things, adding all of these things to our faith. If you have yet to have faith yourself that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins and for mine, that, that he came to this earth, that he is God, that he was sent here to this earth to fulfill all prophecies, to die that, that cruel, agonizing death on the cross, because of your sins. And you feel that you need to come to him tonight. That you need to be baptized. That you want that kingdom. You want to be there as well. You want to make your calling and election sure. The first step is putting him on in baptism. If you have that need of the gospel call tonight, we encourage you to let us know by taking a seat on the front. And if you have to add these qualities back into your life, you have somehow stumbled and failed to do so, and you need encouragement from the brethren, prayers from the congregation, take a seat on the front as well as we stand and sing the invitation song.